a long time ago in the fitness industry, but I kind of have heard every term that you can possibly hear for stabilising the core, and then hear instructors shout them out the whole time. Brace your core, stabilise your core, pull in your uh, abdominal, you know, hold your back straight. Lots of terms that people use for the same thing. So then I got to thinking, it, and I've tried it hundreds of times. Everywhere I go, all over the world, I ask the instructor, what is the core? I asked my husband, he was particularly difficult about it. So, um, so I asked the instructor, and a lot of them will start with TBA and the stabilising muscles. Um, but generally, we'll miss some of those muscles out. So I want you to think about it. It's a tube, almost, of muscles that goes all the way through the centre core that stabilises the unstable areas of the body, which are the pelvis, the spine and the shoulder girdle. So if we have a look at that, the bottom of the core is your pelvic floor. The lid of the core at the top is the diaphragm. The connector of those two is uh, the iliopsoas muscle group, the hip flexor muscle that goes through the pelvic floor uh, and connects the pelvic floor to the diaphragm. So they are connected. Okay, you get with me so far? Um, so you've got the, the pelvic, pelvic floor, floor, you've got the diaphragm as the lid, and you've got oh. the iliopsoas muscle as a connection through. Yeah? Or in layman's terms. Hip flexor. So everybody kind of understands, don't they, the pelvic floor and the, and, and the diaphragm. Um, so let's think about those. So then you come round the front and you have internal obliques, which sit this way, yeah, deep into the abdominal. You have transverse abdominus, which acts as a panty girdle that goes uh, across the way of the abdominals, yeah? And that's the one that holds the abdominals in uh, and flat. Yeah, with me on that. So, so you've kind of got the front bit. So then you come around the back part and you have quadratus lumborum, which sits laterally to the spine, which is gonna stabilize it that way. Then you start to come in a bit and you have multifidus that runs up and down the spine and you have the deep spinalis muscles that run up and down the spine. So you kind of have this tube, don't you? You have a front bit, you have a bottom to it, you have a lid to it, and you have a back to it. So when we talk about this idea of stabilizing the, the deep stabilizer muscles that are local to the unstable areas, that's what we're talking about doing before we move the big global muscles on the body, which cause the movement to happen. And as you just demonstrated by dropping your pen on the floor and seeing if your abs go out when you bend down to pick it up without thinking about it, are you engaging those? You no, know, we push everything away from the stabilization point in order to do it. And of course, we're hanging then on the ligaments of the spine and you're putting the spine at risk. Now do that for 40, 50 years, you'll get back aches. Mm -hmm. And you'll start to get aches and pains in places that you, you wouldn't want to feel them. So when you get back to the principles of teaching exercise then, and you come back to the six principles of Pilates, the term centering means to get hold of those stabilizing muscles and stabilize that central column prior to allowing any movement to happen. So it's as simple as that. So it is quite a simple concept, isn't it, when you think about it. So we have to fire the pelvic floor. Now that takes a lot of practice because a lot of people, uh, A, can have damaged it in childbirth, Men just have never practiced using it. They have one. It goes from your front passage to your back passage. Uh, we have to fire it. It doesn't cause a movement to happen. It, it, it's a, a diamond shaped muscle that sits, um, as I say, to, from your front passage to your back passage. So it's about firing it isometrically and getting that feeling of what it feels like to fire it. So there are exercises you can do to, to learn how to fire it. There's visualizations that you can do, like stopping yourself weeing. Uh, holding a coffin, uh, as, as we did, zipping it up inside you, uh, uh, sucking up a tissue people use. We use lots of visualisation for trying to fire the pelvic floor. So then we did the kind of pulling in through TBA uh, and holding TBA, 
and the measure of whether that was contracting is, uh, and it's really easy to feel, put your hands on where you roughly think TVA is and cough. <coughs> and it's TVA that will brace in and stop all your internal organs busting out and when you cough. So, so it's bracing that and, and igniting that, if you like, that, that does that. So then the diaphragm's an interesting one. So all of you sit forward like this, and just sit forward, quite natural with your shoulders down, and your shoulders is slightly forward. So it's not a bad posture. You wouldn't necessarily look at somebody and go, oh, they're really over like this. Just generally, these bits of your arms, your shoulders, are in slight protraction, they're slightly forward. Now take a big breath in. Okay. Now, take your shoulder girdle back and put it at home. Elevate through the breastbone without flaring the ribs. Now take a big breath in. Which gives you the bigger breath? Second one or, or the first one? And we're only sitting. So we've kind of collapsed down a little bit. We're sitting. Standing, that's got an even bigger effect. And I actually get people in my class to do that. Drop their shoulders forward, take a big breath. Drop their shoulders back, take another big breath. Now, why that happens is the uh, floating ribs, if the shoulder girdle is in protraction forward, lock. Well, the diaphragm, to breathe, has to contract, push down, and push the rib cage out. Well, if you lock the rib cage down at the bottom, how can it? So to a point, if you're in protraction, you've disengaged the lid of the core or not using it as fully effectively as you possibly can. Because the we've already said the diaphragm is part of the core muscles. So we have to free up the diaphragm. So where the breathing comes in, and, and in Pilates they call it lateral breathing, or I call it 360 breathing, mm. if you're centered and you free this up, mm. you can 360 breathe and fully engage the core whilst you do so. Which is why almost every time I changed position with you earlier, I first made you recenter and breathe and feel like you could control breath before you start to control movement. Because if you've got control, again, it's a principle of Pilates. So they're linked, they don't stand alone. So um, if you start to think about that, that in itself has enormous power. And people refer to the powerhouse of centering. Uh, you, you know, people call it your powerhouse. And I don't mind what people call it to a point, as long as they centre it around what it's designed to do. And if you're teaching Pilates, then you have to be using the Pilates methodology. If not, it's body conditioning slowed down. So, so that in itself, how much, I mean, you were, all, you were all teachers and you were all good at it. How many of you in that first session were like, that's really hard to concentrate on? Mm -hmm. And you know, you can't afford to have what you've got to pick up at Sainsbury's tonight coming into your head, can mm -hmm. you really? Because actually you need to be working out what's going on here. And then we cause a movement to happen. So then we're looking at, if we're centered, we have control and our breath work is good. We're concentrating to do that. Now we can move with precision. And the precision of the movement is which bit should be moving and which bit should be staying still. So it's a very easy thing to look at. Which bit should be moving and which bit should be staying still? And if you look at that principle of everyday life again, if you look at dropping your pen on the floor and picking it up, if you thought about centering and you engage the neurology to center and um, contract those muscles prior to bending over to get the pen, you would then keep the back safe instead of putting the back at risk. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, neurologically, and we're gonna look at this in a little bit more detail, and especially if you do some of the other mod modules, neurologically, the brain filters information in what it sees as the most useful way for you as a person, okay? That's why two people can look at the same thing and see something completely different, like you might, pass a house on your way home and you uh, and I'm sure you've done this you pass a house on the way home and you suddenly notice something and you say to your husband or partner you say oh that's got that he said it's always had that because he saw it the first time he ever passed it you didn't see it the first time you ever passed it you saw different things so your brain filters what it sees or does in a, in a particular way well movement is very much the same way movement is a neurologically 
recruited pathway. And it's quite interesting today watching a couple of you who couldn't separate and articulate out through the spine or to breathe lifts the shoulders to start with instead of expanding through the feet. That's because your brain has adapted that as the most useful way to recruit the muscle groupings to cause that action to happen. So when you're asking your brain to do that, it's going to recruit what it's normally recruiting. Does that make sense? So sometimes you have to unlearn a neural pattern to relearn a neural pattern in order to recruit the right muscles. Because it was interesting when I put the strap on, on you. Yeah, that, had, that did it. It did it because yeah. suddenly you could articulate through lumbar spine because your brain didn't have a choice then. And now if you did that a few times, before long it would be normal for you to articulate through lumbar spine instead of moving the whole thing as a hinge. Does that make sense? I want to give you another example. So, you know, imagine this is a, we're at a party and you're sitting here at a drinks table. And I want you to reach forward and uh, get your drink. Most of the time, people will first lean forward from the hip and hinge off the hip, won't they? They'll lean forward from here and then they'll grab their drink. So actually, their brain to reach something has created an incorrect movement pattern. Yeah? Does that make sense? That's an example of how your brain recruits. So therefore, whenever you reach anything, you lean forward automatically from there on in, even if you don't need to. Yeah? Look at a child who does a perfect squat. Yeah? You've seen them, haven't you? Can you do a perfect squat like a child can do? But neurologically, so neurologically, it stopped recruiting that, so it learned a completely different pathway, and that became normal. So when you're looking at centering precision and control, what you're trying to do when you establish your precision markers is which bit should be moving and which bit shouldn't, really diagnostically watching that and then helping somebody stop the incorrect movement pattern and engaging them in the correct movement pattern so that over time their brain will learn the correct movement pattern and therefore it will become functional to recruit the muscles in that way to do that activity. Does that make sense, what precision is? So if we allow precision markers to go, and we allow people to move without precision, then again, we're letting Joseph Pilates down because he developed such a unique, powerful system. Does that make sense? And then flow, as I say, I just think flow is beauty and grace. It's kind of the last thing I bring into an exercise. It's the least I worry about until people can it's aesthetic yeah um and it also shows control doesn't it yeah you, you know and there were some movements that were really easy to flow like arm movements yeah and there were other movements like coming out of a teaser yeah. that we just wanted to dump out of it rather than flow out of it does that make sense but so flow also indicates control uh, but over time we'll get strong enough to keep the flow of a movement and therefore move fluidly and movement that mo moves fluidly with flow is the most functional movement you can get it's most functional think about uh, a ballet dancer There's a couple of you who are dancers here if you watch a ballet dancer move through something they'll move with flow of a movement. Think about a javelin thrower. It's a flowing movement. At a good level of control and neural recruitment, they do it beautifully with fluid, uh, with flow. Somebody learning it doesn't do it with flow. No. They'll do it jerkily and it's not pretty. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't look pretty. Yeah, But the more competent they get at a movement, the more neural recruitment is recruited in the right way, the more flow comes into it, the more functional that movement pattern becomes. So if you can get up and down and into a chair with flow, it's very functional. What a lot of people have to do is launch themselves out of a chair and drop themselves back in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I have a thing when I walk downstairs in the morning, it's a real challenge at my age, I want to tell you. I grab hold of the banister on the stairs. Do you do this? You grab hold of the banister on the stairs. And I walk down the stairs and I find myself clumping a bit down the stairs. You know, let, I get, get like a <coughs> like this shock as you go down each step because you're dropping this heavier weight on, onto the step below. 
So over the years that I've developed my knowledge of, of this sort of action and the, the control and the precision of the movement, what am I lacking if I'm going downwards in my quads and glutes? So I'm going downwards. So think about what the muscle contraction phase is. I'm going down the stairs. So my quads and glutes are, are contracting, but which way are they contracting? Concentrically or eccentrically? If it's a downward yeah. phase, eccentrically. If it's a downward right. phase, it's right. eccentrically. Yeah. So if I'm jerking as I walk down the stairs, I'm losing gradually eccentric control. So I challenge myself every day, no matter what I've got in my hands, to go down the stairs without holding on to the banister. And the more I did it, the more I was able to do it, the more I was able to get functional flow in doing that because the more my brain recruits it eccentrically and takes control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So flow is an indicator of control. The movement is more fluid, more functional, more flowing. That's why we bring flow into the movement. Because if we, but we, in order to flow, we have to be centered. We have to be concentrating. We have to be focused. We have to be under control. The movement has to be pre precise. Otherwise, how can we flow it into the functionality that it needs to be? Does that make sense? So for me, these are six incredible principles that, that Joseph Pilates came up with, that if you advertise a Pilates class and you do not use these principles, and I see many Pilates classes out there that do not use these principles, and I'm saying this live on Facebook, I don't know why I'm saying that on Facebook <laughs> Live, but if I see that, I get really frustrated because it's a Pilates style class, it is body conditioning slowed down, it's using similar exercises to the classical 34, but it is not being taught in the Pilates method, therefore it is not Pilates. And, I, and I'm very clear on that, very clear on that. I'm very clear on that because I work in a functional movement clinic. So for me, that's the value of what you need to do teaching Pilates. Oh!